So today's message is called The Gospel for Christians, Killing Sin. And it's a gospel-centered message. It starts with the gospel. But one of the things that I think is, is a common problem with Christians is that the gospel is something that was great. It's the good news, right? That's what the gospel means, the good news of Jesus Christ. And we received that, and it saved us. We actually believed That Jesus was who he said he was, that he died and was buried and raised to life, and that he took our sins on him so that the wrath of God that will come on the day of judgment will not get to us. And we are saved from darkness into into light, from, from death into life, from hell into heaven. And we view the gospel as this great, great, great thing, but sometimes we view it as something that that had an effect on us when we were saved. And, and that's great, but it doesn't continue to actually matter to us today in, in a way that pushes us forward into the image of God, into the image of Christ. And today, Paul's message here to the church in Colossae is starting with the gospel as the reason why we care about sin and also the how to how do we actually conquer sin. And, and we should ask the question, do we need to? Do we need to put sin away in our life? And so these are some of the questions that we'll wrestle with. Um, as I said in my prayer, this is, this is a message to Christians here today because that's who Paul's talking to. So if you don't believe in, in Jesus, if, if right now you're not sure that you are a disciple of Jesus Christ and, and you have not been made new and born again, I pray that God will speak to you through this message. But I'm not speaking to you today. This is not an evangelistic sermon. This is a sermon to those of you in this room who would say that you are a son or daughter of God, that you're in the family of God, that you believe in Jesus Christ, you have been born again, because that's who Paul's talking to, and so that's who I'm going to talk to today. And we're going to confront ourselves on our sin. Me and you, all of us together, that's what Paul wants, and and so that's what we're going to do. Let's start in uh, chapter 3, verse 1. And and if you haven't heard me preach here before, uh, I just tend to kind of keep going back and forth in the text. So I I would recommend have the text out and we'll just keep diving right back into it as we go along. So starting in verse 3, it says, Therefore, if you have been raised up with Christ, keep seeking the things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Now as a point of clarity here, This is why I'm saying that we're only speaking to Christians, because he says, if you have been raised up with Christ. There is not some Christians that have been raised up with Christ, and some Christians who haven't been raised up with Christ. That is, if you're in Christ, if you've put your faith in Christ, you have been co-resurrected with Christ right now. We are hidden with Christ in God. And so this is to all Christians. And he continues on and says, set your mind... On the things above, not on the things of the earth. Set your mind on the things above, not on the things of the earth. And I'll say it one more time. Set your mind on the things above, on the things in the heavenly realm, on the things of Christ, on the things of the future, on the promises of God. Set your mind on those things, not on the things of earth. This is the key verse we're going to be dealing with today, is is really the, the second half of verse 1. And, and, and verse 2. But I'm going to skip this for now. I repeated it so that, so that you can remember the importance of this verse as Paul continues to, to teach Christians how to kill their sin. And we'll come back to this verse in a little bit. But you'll see the next two verses are really uh, the gospel here. He reminds them of what's been done for them and what's been done for us. He says, for you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, is revealed, then you also will be revealed with him in glory. This is the gospel. We have been saved by Christ, and when he comes back, he's bringing us with him. We will be revealed in glory with eternal life forever. That's a big deal that we just so often just don't care about in our, in our normal day-to-day life, that we, we recognize and we forget. And he's just reminding us, right? So little of this job at the pulpit is, is, is teaching and so much is reminding and saying, remember who we are. The Bible, a million times throughout it, is saying, remember, remember, remember. And, and so the, there's this idea that we are hidden in Christ. And sometimes people are confused. What does that mean to be hidden uh, in Christ with God? And, and what we're hidden from is the wrath of God, which we're going to talk about today. And I know it's everybody's favorite topic. 
right? Wrath and sin, those are the things we love to talk about. And so, of course, those are what we're talking about today. Um, but we're hidden from that wrath. It, it, it harkens back to Exodus 12 and 13, to the original Passover meal. Okay, that meal that, that was so incredibly important in the history of our planet, where the, the plagues were coming upon Egypt for their disobedience to God, and the firstborn sons were going to be wiped out. And, and God gave this bizarrely specific instructions to his people and said, you have to grab your staff and gird your loins, and you've got uh, you know, to eat quick, and you've got to have this perfect lamb, this spotless lamb. It has to be, oh, your family's too small? Go find a bigger family and get their lamb. It's got to be at this time of this day of this month. This incredibly very specific thing about this Passover meal. And what they were to do was to sacrifice a perfect lamb and eat that as their Passover meal. And then they take the blood of the spotless lamb and they put it on the post outside their door. Because when the Spirit of God came to pour out the wrath on the firstborn sons for the disobedience of the people, the Spirit of God would look on the blood of the lamb and the people of God were hidden by the blood of the lamb. Of course, it's, it's no coincidence that fast forward a few thousand years and that Jesus was that perfect lamb on that same day, the same hour, the same mind at the, the Passover festival. That's where Jesus went to the cross. And we, Christians, let's remind ourselves that we are hidden from that wrath of God by the blood of the perfect lamb, by the blood of Jesus. And so when that wrath is poured out, we are saved from it. We're free from it. And we see the wrath of God as this bad thing, but we'll talk about it in just a second, that it's a great thing. But he says all of this, all of this, hopefully they knew, hopefully all of us Christians knew already, to remind us of what is coming and, and to say, this is the reason. He, he goes on and says, therefore, in verse 5, therefore, because of all that has been done for you, therefore, consider the members of your earthly body as dead to immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and greed, which is idolatry. For it is because of these things that the wrath of God will come upon the sons of disobedience. It, it, do we realize that the wrath of God that we don't want to talk about and that we think we hate is solely there because of our sin, is because of the sin of people and humanity? The wrath of God was not a, a, a necessary thing for no reason, it's not a bully. God is not wanting to pour out wrath. It is a necessary thing because of our sin. So Paul's saying, why would you want, why, you've been saved from this. Why would you want to keep adding to that? And so what do we know about sin? What does the Bible teach us about sin from the beginning to the end? The first thing we learn about sin is that death comes into the world through sin. That the, the, the wages of sin are death. That, seth, that, that sin brings about death over and over, front to back. Sin is the cause of death. And you cannot have eternal life with death. Those things are mutually exclusive from, from the standpoint of... Think about in, in our human realm, the things that bring about death and how we deal with them. Cancer. We want God to just forgive every sin, Right? But when we get cancer, do we just go, you know what, I forgive you, cancer, and we just leave it alone? Or do we pour out our wrath on cancer? Do we take a knife and literally cut it out of our body if we can? And if we can't, we'll take chemotherapy and we will almost destroy our physical cells just to kill this thing that brings about death. God's wrath is a blessing to purge the thing that brings about death in, in creation. And all of creation groans for his coming back where death is gone. And, and that's why Jesus came, was to kill death, to destroy death. Praise God. That's the gospel we've entered into. So why do you want to be okay living in sin, in more sin? All the sin that we have ever done, that we do today, that we will do tomorrow, has all been poured out on Jesus on the cross. He took what I have done, what I deserved, what you have done, what you deserved for the wrath that you're bringing about death into this world, and poured it on Jesus, our Savior. Paul's saying, why would you want to keep on adding to that? So because of those reasons... Consider your earthly body as dead because we have died with Christ on the cross. We went with Christ on the cross to immorality, 
impurity, passion, evil desire, and greed. So now we're going to take a look at the, at the sins. Now that we understand, look, if we are in Christ, we should not be okay with sin. So we're going to take a look at the sins that Paul is calling out his people and say, do we, Desert Hills, do you, do I, do we struggle with these sins and are they okay to struggle with? And before we get into the talk for the next 10 or 15 minutes, specifically just on a, on a, on a, on a list of sins in our life, I want to debunk or, or talk about two wrong teachings on sin that are really common um, and, and really harmful and destructive. And I, and I think that the people in this room, if, if we give careful, considerate, thoughtful mind to this topic, we would actually end on the center road. We would, we would get this right. But when we're not carefully in thinking about it, we could end up swinging uh, to the right or to the left you know, the, the, uh, getting off that center way of Christ. So on one side on the teachings of sin is that when you become a Christian, you will never sin again. You're healed from sin. And in, and in fact, if you sin, maybe you need to think whether you were saved. Right? And that teaching is clearly wrong. Paul's talking only to Christians here about their sin. So it, he's not saying you're not a Christian. He's saying, hey, you've been raised up with Christ. Let's care about our sin. So we know that that teaching is wrong. And, and it's also destructive because what happens then when you or when I sin? Do we question our salvation? Do we question our faith? Do we question Christ and his power because we've got this wrong teaching? No, we know that we sin. And so because we know that we sin, we can swing the pendulum too far to the other side and say, and I think this is probably the more common problem for those of us in this room, because we acknowledge our sin here. Jesus doesn't make sense without understanding our sin. There's, there's, no, there's nothing to save us from uh, if, if, if we don't understand that we're sinners. But we can be so comfortable with knowing that we are sinners that even after being saved, look, we're going to sin. We're going to fall. And I'm a sinner, and my only natural state is nothing but sin. I can't do anything but sin. And that teaching goes so far over here that what ends up happening is sin because, becomes so common and so acceptable that we accept it in our life. Right? There's just nothing we can do about it. I'm going to sin again, so I'm going to become apathetic to my sin. And that teaching goes too far to the other side. That teaching here, Paul clearly is condemning. He's saying, no, you need to care about the sin in your life. This matters for you as, you know, it gets into uh, in verse uh, 10 and 11 that, that we are in a process of sanctification, that we are being made into the image of God. And that takes kind of learning from our sin, taking these opportunities for, for sin in our life and doing something with it. So today, now we get the fun time of confronting ourselves of sins, very specific sins, and seeing, is this in my life? If so, how do I get rid of it? So this list, immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, all four of those sins are sexual sins. In the Greek, the, the first word there on immorality, it, I, actually the translation that, that was read here beforehand said sexual immorality, which is the better translation. It's, the root word is porneia. That's the word we get pornography from and, and, and that whole gamut. It means illicit sexual activity. It very commonly used with prostitution. In, in, in old literature, prostitution. Think about the fact that, I mean, we're within probably a, a mile or two at all times of a place where you can go and spend money to have sexually illicit uh, dancing. I mean, this is common. This is, this is, these are things we deal with. Everyone has a computer or a, or a phone or a tablet. Pornography is one of the absolute destroyers of the current church. Especially for men in the church who are supposed to lead and supposed to be pure. But it's not just the act. It's not just the going to a prostitute. You might think, oh, well, I, I've never been to a prostitute, so I'm okay. But it goes on to, to uh, be beyond just the immorality, but to impurity. And to passions, those lust. Right? Jesus said, you've heard it said that, you know, if you commit adultery, that, that, that that's wrong. But I say to you that if you look at a woman with lust on her that, that you've committed adultery. This goes beyond it. It goes to your heart because sin isn't just what you do. Sin is, is what is your heart? Your, your heart is, is, what, is where sin comes out of. And so we need to be careful with that. And really, I love this last one, the evil desire, because we talk about sin. And, and I'm up here saying sin. And we've heard sin so much. 
It was just, you know, we're sinners and I'm going to sin and I'm freed from my sin and sin and sin and sin. It becomes trivialized. The word sin kind of means nothing. But sin is truly evil. It is so destructive and harmful to ourselves, to those around us, to our loved ones, to our relationships. I mean, those of us who've been saved, we, we know what happened when we by the grace of God, got rid of so many sins in our life and how much better our our relationships and our families and, and all these things got because sin is evil. And then he goes on and says, okay, how about greed? Greed, and uh, which amounts to idolatry. Greed and idolatry are the bookends of the Ten Commandments. Thou shalt have no other God from me. Thou shalt not covet. These are, these are pretty big common things. And I would say in America, in the American church, greed and idolatry, we live in a Western uh, individualized society. It's about me. I'm more important. And and while sin is evil and destructive, and there's so many layers, we could preach a sermon series just on on sin for weeks, I think the easiest way to think about, like, what what is a sin? The easiest way to boil it down to, for me, is selfishness. It's putting yourself before God, Putting yourself before others. It's the opposite of the two great commandments of love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and mind and love your neighbor as yourself. When we are self-centered and self-caring and greedy, we are necessarily living in sin. We are self-idols. It's idolatry. It's saying that we are God. We are most important. We, and then we go into the fleshly desires. And think about the, the, the gospels that are, that are taught today of, of uh, come to Jesus so that you can get more on earth. So that your life on earth can be better. Which is, there is an aspect of truth to your life on earth being better. Having a fullness and joy in Christ. Having a, a contentment with what you have and, and, and having a freedom from these sins that just terrorize our families and our homes and ourself. There is truth to, to that aspect of it, but our reward is in heaven. Think about uh, what Jesus said at the Sermon on the Mount. He said, when you pray, don't pray in public for, for people to see. He wasn't condemning public prayer, but for the purpose of look at me, look how righteous I am. When you give, don't blow the horn and, and, and give so that everybody can know, look, you are such a giver. You're so great. Because he says that's your reward in full. If you're concerned about the rewards here and now, we talked about this a couple weeks ago, right? The, the, the love of men, the, of people, if that's what you're after, then that's your reward. God wants you to have a far greater reward, a reward in heaven. And so he continues on and he says... In verse 8, but now you also put them all aside. Actually, I skipped a verse. And in them you also once walked when you were living in them. He's pointing out two things that, one, it humbles us. There's nobody in this room that's better than the unbeliever. We are extremely, infinitely better off at no doing of our own. But we aren't inherently better. We weren't sinless. We did not do this. Jesus did this for us. We put our faith in Jesus, not ourselves. And, and so the other thing it does is it says, you lived in this life. You already tried that. You tried greed. You tried caring about the world. You tried sexual immorality. It didn't work. It didn't ever fulfill you. You weren't ever content. Something was missing. God was missing. So he continues on and says, but now you also put them all aside. And this list this list is the list I think that should really cut us because I think it's common. Common in most every single person in this room. It's common in maybe most days of their week. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, and abusive speech. In every small group I've ever led, in men's groups, um, in, in my own house, anger is something that's talked about a lot, right? We, we pray for struggling with our anger so often, um, and, and we hear about anger from friends. We see anger from those around us. Anger is so common that it's accepted. And we might know, we might know it's wrong, we might apologize, but at the same time, there's a real problem with anger specifically because anger is always justified. 
And here's the thing. Anger is never, ever justified. But the point of anger is to be justified. It's always, be, it's their fault. It's, it's not my fault. It's your fault that I am angry. Or it's this thing's fault that happened to me. That's why I'm angry. I am completely justified in my anger because of X. And you justify that that, that is okay. The Bible says it's not. And, and if I can confront, because I'm talking to Christians here, if I can confront some teachings on anger that just deeply sadden me, Anger is one of those things that is justified within Christianity, within Christians out in the world, and maybe in this room. I have heard it preached from the pulpit by different preachers to promote anger over Christian things. And and don't, don't misinterpret me here. We stand for truth. We seek justice. When there is wrong in the world, we go after it. I'm not saying just... Let everything go. But what I'm saying is that when you go after things with anger, you're, you're cutting the legs out from underneath your own uh, attempt at, at, at propagating righteousness. And, and so anger is something where I, when I first uh, recorded this sermon, it was an hour and 15 minutes. So I won't do that to you. Um, but there was a list of anger that I wanted to go through in the Bible. And I just recommend Google Google anger Bible and, see, and just read the verses and see if there's a way that you can say, yeah, you know what? The righteous indignation that Jesus showed when he flipped over tables, I'm going to use that to justify my anger instead of the 50 or 60 or 70 other verses that condemn anger, say, don't, don't be angry, put anger away, do not sin in your anger. I, I think the best verse to sum it up is in James where he says the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. There you go. You cannot produce the righteousness of God with the anger of man. And so let us put to bed anger and know that anger is wrong and it's so common, but it's wrong and it needs to go away in our own house. What if this church and my family and every family in this church put away anger? And anger, which leads, I mean, it, this, this first list here, anger, wrath, malice, that, that's just a progression of anger. Wrath is extreme anger. Malice is the planning of evil out of anger. What if we got rid of anger and showed Christ's love in our own life and, and anger was just abolished? If we just literally think about what would my family look like if anger was gone? I think it would be a far bigger change to our families than we realize. And I think that that if we could, as a church, rally around uh, this and get rid of anger as a church, that we could move mountains. Because we're not precluding ourselves from the righteousness of God by anger. And then he goes on and says, abusive speech, which this can be translated a lot of different ways. It's basically unhealthy words out of your mouth. It could be curse words, but it could be gossip. It could be slander. It says slander and abusive speech. It could be talking poorly about other people behind other people's backs. And I want you and me, I've I've done this this week, and I'm asking everybody here to think about their closest friends in this church right now. Think about the people that you spend the most time with. Or even maybe they're not in this church. Maybe they're out of this church. Think about those people that you talk to the most. And ask yourself, have I talked bad about someone else to that person? Have I spoke ill words of someone to my best friend? Has my best friend spoken ill words of someone else to me? And I listened. And I... I, I participated in that. Sometimes it's not the person who is speaking slanderously and speaking ill words and having a potty mouth and filthy language and these things. Sometimes it's the, it's the tempter that says, yeah, I love gossip. I want to hear it. Give me, the, give me the, the down low on people. And within a church, this is probably the most common thing that destroys a church body, a local church body. We think about the giant sins, don't murder, sexual immorality, all these giant things. But it's usually your words and your divisiveness and your gossip and your slander amongst 
ourselves that really destroy local bodies of churches. And so we, we have to put that aside. And also, very similar to the anger, it's the political season, right? And social media. Yay! We live in a time of social media. Uh, I'm so thrilled. And um, we want to share our opinions. And let me tell you, maybe your opinion is right and is biblical and is good and needs to be shared. And I applaud you for sharing a good biblical opinion. But when I see these good biblical opinions shared in slanderous ways, in ways that mock people and make fun of people and tear people down, there's Christian authors and Christian writers who I think, man, their content is so good, but why are they so abusive with their language? They're cutting out their own legs from under their argument, or you disagree with Paul. We have to put abusive language and, and slander and these things out of our life and out of our mouth. And, and it goes on and says, don't lie to one another, right? So maybe you're just going to do all the bad things, but you're going to lie about it. And then you'll feel just fine. You get in your small group, how are you doing? I'm doing real good. I mean, I'm just, God is good. God is good. And then that is not at all how you're doing. We have put off the old self. That old self has died. And, and so in your small groups, not only do I encourage you to be honest, but I, the gospel demands that we are gracious of, of that honesty, that we are a place where we can share that honesty, right? Because part of the reason we lie to one another is because we're afraid of their reactions. We're afraid um, that we can't share it, and we should be a place that has grace in, in our small groups or in our families, in our homes, in this body, so don't lie to one another either, because that will really, that, what that does is that lays sin on top of sin. Because when you're doing great, you, you tend to not lie, because lying is just covering up things. But when you're doing bad, that's when it's most important to not lie, and that's when we add that on. And, and we can't forget the evil, destructive nature of this sin. And the people that we are hurting when we do that, ourselves, our friends, our family, our local body, you don't realize how much your individual life because we live in America where it's just individual. Hey, if it harms you, it's not going to harm me or it doesn't matter to me. That's not true. It, it's a novel idea, but it's not the truth. We are connected as a body, and what we do in our individual lives affects this body here and the greater body. So as Christians, we have to make sure that we demand that sin be cast out of our life, according to Paul. And so that's great. But how? How? How do you do it? How do we actually cast out sin? Because it's all well and good to say, don't, don't be angry. Don't be angry. Don't be angry. Don't be angry. I'm not going to be angry because I know I struggle with anger. I'm going to focus on that this week. And I'm not going to be angry. I am going to put anger to bed. I'm going to kill anger. That's, that's the verbiage here is actually to put it to death. And guess what is on your mind? Anger. And guess what you're going to be? Angry. The solution of how do we actually put to death our sin is in this text. And it's not by concentrating on that. We know that from Paul in Romans. He does what he doesn't want to do. He says, I wouldn't have known what coveting was if the Bible hadn't told me, do not covet. But the more I thought about coveting, the more I coveted. And we just did coveting, right? Greed. Don't be greedy. Don't worry about the things of this world. Don't do it, don't do it, don't do it. And then you're going to do it. So what do we do? What is the solution? And I think the solution, when I say one word, and when I only explain it with one word, I think it might surprise you. It's your mind. Your mind is the solution. And I think that that sounds scary at first glance. Because we tend to think from ourself. And so if I leave it to my mind... That's going to be bad news. I'm going, to, I'm going to create whatever I want to create. But it is your mind. That's what the Bible says. And I don't hear that taught that often. Look back at the verse we skipped. Set your mind, in verse 2, set your mind on the things above, not on the things of the earth. What are we supposed to give God the main? Look, if you can do this, you will do it all. Love God with all your heart. Yes, all your soul. And all your mind. The way to eliminate sin is 
to put our mind on the things above and not on the things of this earth. The more we turn our life to focus on Jesus, what he has done, what he has done for us, because we can't kill sin, but Jesus can, and we are dead, and he lives in us. When our mind is on the heavenly things, our desires are on the heavenly things. Sin grows strangely dim. The solution here is our mind, and if you don't believe it, Let me just throw out a couple of other verses in the scripture that talk very similar passages to this about, look, if you want to die to sin and live for Christ, right? Paul said, for me to die is gain, to live is Christ. And and that's because the mind has to be on Christ. Romans 12, 2, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. Ephesians 4, 22 through 24, that in reference to the former manner of life, you lay aside the old self, which is being corrupted in accordance with the lusts of deceit, and that you be renewed in the spirit of your mind. 1 Peter 1.13, therefore preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. And so we have to ask ourselves, how much do we set our mind on the things above? Because we're always thinking. Your mind never turns off, except maybe when you sleep. I don't don't know. I'm I'm not a scientist. But I know that you're thinking. You're thinking thoughts right now. Maybe you're thinking about the potluck. Maybe you're thinking about this. I don't know, but I know you're thinking. When you drive home, you're going to be thinking. I I pray you think about the drive in that moment. Uh, But maybe you're not. Maybe you're thinking about the next meal and, and dinner. But you're always thinking. And so think about just yesterday, the 24 hours in that day, you thought for 100% of it. Or if if you're like me, you probably thought for like 95%. I kind of space out a lot. But let's just call it 100% of your day was in thought. How much of your thought was on the things above? Did you think about Christ yesterday? Did you think about the gospel? Did you share the gospel to yourself? When's the last time you've thought about heaven and the rewards that wait for you in heaven? How much percentage of your time did you think about that? I venture to guess that as a group, we are close to zero. And then we're surprised when we sin and we have anger and we have these things in our life. But we need to set our mind on the things above. How do we do that? I mean, look look at the continuation here of these verses, it says you have put off the old self with its evil practices in verse 10 and have put on the new self who is being renewed to a true knowledge according to the image of the one who created him. A renewal in which there is no distinction between Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave and freeman, but Christ is all and in all. That when we look at each other, when we look at one another, do you see Christ? When you look at me, do you see the character uh, of of Christ? Or when people look at you, do they see that out of your life? So how do we set our mind on Christ so that we look more like the image of our creator? More and more. And cast out these sins. We need to be realistic in, in, in knowing what to do. Well, we have to start with truth. Has to start with truth. Because, like I said a minute ago, if we just create the things ourselves. We're probably going to get ourselves into trouble. It has to start with the word of God and the truth of God because God gave this to us for a reason. Right? The, 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 uh, the other verses here that I read uh, in Ephesians 4, it says that we're being corrupted in accordance with the lusts of deceit, of, of, of misinformation. How is the devil referred to in the Bible? The father of lies. Lying is his native tongue. Truth is the first thing we have to set our mind on. And when we set our mind on truth and we come from God's word, we can, we can focus more on what he has told us. We can focus on the promises that he has given us, on what he has already done for us on the cross. We can think about uh, memorizing scripture How much of your day, put it this way, do you think that an NBA basketball player gets better at his job 
when he studies film and puts his mind completely to his craft. I certainly do. I think that if you look at the best people in the world at their craft, they set their mind entirely on their craft. And where your treasure is, there your heart is. And so where is our mind set? Are we setting our mind on the future of Christ coming back and us being made new in glory with him and that we want to be ready for that moment? If Christ came back right now, literally, if if Christ came back, would we be rejoicing and so excited we have prepared ourselves for him? Would we be a little afraid? Would we be... Uh, terrified of man i have not i don't i don't give any mind i don't give any mind to christ i don't spend any thought i'm not following after him because christians brothers and sisters in christ we know the monumental thing that's been done for us we're not talking about um getting a job we're talking about eternal condemnation into eternal life without sin where I'm not going to be any more selfish than you are. I'm not going to judge you. You're not going to judge me. The holiness and the beautiful nature of being a part of God's family is is something we need to think about. We need to set our mind on things above and not on the things on earth. That needs to be the focus this week. I don't want anybody leaving here thinking the focus this week is to get rid of anger and get rid of lust and get rid of these things. The Bible says we need to be wise as serpents, and innocent as doves. Well, we need to be wise as serpents and know what we need to get rid of. Certainly. The serpents know their sins. But we need to be innocent as doves and keep our mind focused on pure things. When you, when you drive in the car, do you uh, constantly listen you know, to just the normal radio stations or, or talk radio and, and fill your mind with, hey, i got to know more about politics or sports? I'm a sports guy, right? I listen to a lot of sports stuff, and this has been something that's kind of confronted me this week, is do I just fill my mind with everything in the world? Where is my mind focused? Is your mind focused on your business? Congratulations, you'll get better at your business, and you'll get your reward there in full. Is your mind focused on your family? Is that where your focus is? I mean, we trade the greatness of God for good things. We don't normally trade them for bad things. We trade them for good things, but they rob us from great things, and they cause sin to be in our life because now we are consumed with the things of the world. We care about our job, and we care about our our home, and we care about uh, our, our work, and we care about our sports, and we care about our hobbies, and we care about everything that the world cares about. And there's just no room to care about the things of God and the gospel and the saving grace that's been given to you and how good God is. When's the last time you've thought about God's character and his attributes and spent some time in that? And so here's what I would say when it comes to uh, some next steps. First is read your Bible. That's kind of a given. But if you think that you struggle with sin right now. If you think, look, I've struggled with some of these things that have been brought up. Don't do nothing about it. Realize your mind is not on the Lord enough. And now I'm not saying that you're going to get rid of all sin and how dare you sin. This, this is a problem for me. I'm preaching to myself here. But we need to realize that we need to shift it over. And if you don't know the Bible, if you're like, well, I don't know where to begin, the Bible's where to begin. How about talking with our friends, our Christian friends? When we talk to one another, do we just catch up about how our world is? Or do we talk about spiritual things? Do we talk about what God has been showing us in his word? Do we we share what God has done and and these things? One of the favorite things that I love about Desert Hills is from 10 o'clock to 1030 here. There is so many people that get here at 10, either they're out of the Sunday school or they come early and there's so much fellowship and love and talking and communication. It is wonderful and is great. That is literally one of my favorite things of this church. And I was thinking, how much of that conversation at church with Christians is centered around God? I couldn't think of much. 
Because that's not our mindset. Our mind is focused on the things of earth. We need to shift our focus and think about the things of God. And so I'm going to leave you with a verse. I had a, a, something this last semester in seminary where I had to memorize Psalm 103. It's a rather large psalm. And it, it was forced on me. And it was awesome. I had no idea how much that would affect every aspect of my life. It started seeping into my thoughts and into my minds and into my desires, into my prayer life, which it helped create more of. Memorizing Scripture is a great thing. So I'm going to challenge us this week to memorize one verse of Scripture. And you don't have to do it, but I, I encourage you to. Come next week and, and tell me uh, the verse. And hopefully I can tell it to you back. Because hopefully I have done the same thing here and, and memorized this verse of Scripture. It's just a, a, a fun thing to get us in here. But this verse is something that speaks to the whole message of setting our mind on Jesus and on the things that are above and taking our mind off of the things of the earth. Turn back just a couple of pages, depending on your font size, to Philippians 4. And if you don't memorize it, come to church. We have grace But Philippians 4, verse 8, this is kind of a concluding verse very similar to uh, where we're at in, I mean, this is Paul writing just very similar content. But this verse is just so great because if we memorize it, which should be easy, it's got a lot of repetition in it. If we memorize this verse uh, and put our mind onto this, this verse will help seep into our day. And we might think about the things of this verse. And all of a sudden, next thing we know, our, our minds are set on, on healthy, good things. And our desires change. And, and it's not that we have to, we have to uh, battle with sin. It's that we get to live in, in God's blessing because of the power of the Holy Spirit. Remember, in Second Peter, he says that his divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and God, godliness. Christians, we, we can love God with our full heart and cast these out. And so here's the verse, uh, Philippians 4, 8. And I hope you will take this challenge with me this week and, and continue on. And maybe next week we'll have a lot of uh, talk about the things above in the foyer. It says, finally, brethren, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely... Whatever is of good repute, if there is any excellence and if anything worthy of praise, dwell on these things. So let's do that this week. Let's make sure that we're not spending 100% of our time dwelling on our life and our job and our bills. And let's spend some time this week dwelling and thinking and praying about the things above and being grateful for that and see how God moves in this church. Let me close this in prayer.